HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink, inspiring public curiosity about food. Learn more at mofad.org. I'm HRN's Communications Director, Kat Johnson, with a preview of this week's episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. This week, we're celebrating Valentine's Day. Whether it's your favorite day of the season or you avoid it like the plague, there's no debating. It's a big day for the world of food and hospitality. Valentine's Day is what we uh, refer to in the industry as a blackout day. I don't feel that my manlyhood is threatened when I order a glass of rosé or, God forbid, a rosé champagne. It's an old Jamaican drink from way back, and we just decided to bring it back into existence. It's a drink that the men, they believe it really does wonders. Tune in to this week's Meet and 3 on Heritage Radio Network. That's M-E-A-T plus sign T-H-R-E-E. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here. We've got a special New York City Beer Week preview show. We've got some great guests. Guys, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. This guy is known as the Yeti. The Yeti. Pat Fondiller, Alewife Brewing Company. Pat, it's great having you on the show, man. You've, you, you've been such a figure. You've been a, a rep. You worked at the gate forever. Uh, now you're at Alewife, so we've got a lot to talk about today. Yeah. yeah. Great. And our uh, a good friend... Uh, Danny Oliver from hey, Island to Island. Danny Oliver from Island to Island in the building, y'all. So you're making like a, you're here all month and you're coming in for like four weeks straight, aren't you? I got to hang out with my favorite radio host. So keep checking her out on an Instagram post. What is it? American Women in Beer? Yes. That's an Instagram post. She's doing live, yep. uh, live Instagram stories with us today. And uh, one of our favorite beer experts. Hey, Jimmy. You're everything. You're a Cicerone. You're a consultant. You've, uh. Got your hand in quite a few things in the beer world. Yeah, that's right. James Ty, beer acolyte consulting. So uh, just kind of like, you know, getting myself out there and uh, keeping keeping relevant in the New York City craft beer and scene. And he just started his Instagram account, at beer acolyte. <laughs> that's right. I'm, uh, yeah. Forever, right? Regrettably so, yes. Four years later. Yes. And uh, the big f- focus of our show is uh, our buddy Matt. How are you, buddy? Good. Hey, uh, Matt from Coney Island Brewery, the head brewer, and uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, the original I- idea for this show was to talk about what brewers are drinking. And uh, yesterday, a, a listener sent me a photo of the Burley Oak uh, from Maryland, their J Ream series beers, which is like a smoothie sour. And that, a lot of those kind of beers, lactose beers. And the last year, you know, you were on, Matt, we had a show about lactose beers. But it's funny because that, that brewer uh, at Burley Oak said, well, uh, you know, that's what I'm making, but I'm actually drinking uh, Three's Vleet Pills. And I know a lot of brewers say that they're drinking pills. Uh, Scott Veltman up at Indian Ladder uh, S- Cider and Brewery sent me a message. He said, "Well, I'm drinking Pilsner too." Um, and I just heard that Yepi from Evil Twin was also like, "He's like, well, now that I'm, you know, actually have have a small brewery in in Queens, I'm going to make the styles I grew up with, which for him are some Belgian beers and German beers." So um, let's let's talk about what you're doing because I know you're kind of in the same situation, right? You've got your nice what ten barrel system at, at, at Coney Island. 
Yeah, that's right. We got a ten barrel system down there, and you know, um, you know what we we're driving innovation. Um, you know, a lot of our, our our bigger our bigger beers are brewed at our flagship facility. Our, I'm sorry, our production facility. Our flagships are brewed there. Um, so that gives me the opportunity at Coney to kind of do some innovative things. And in the summertime, we're pumping out beer just to to fill the tap lines. But this time of year, I get to brew the kind of stuff that I want to drink uh, when I get off of work, which is my favorite time of year. So, um, so that's what we're doing. Yeah. So we're gonna take you're gonna take us through that. So this is the kind of beer that you like to drink. So what is this first one? That's right. Yeah. This is uh this is a traditional farmhouse um, Belgian saison. Um, super funky. Uh, fermented about 80 degrees. Um, we sparged intentionally a lot hotter than we normally would uh, at about 170, 175 degrees or so to extract some tannins from the grain. So what you get is like a lot of fruit forward kind of citrus stuff from the yeast uh, and then some tannin and some phenolics as well on the back end. So it's very dry, but um, you know, I think it's extremely drinkable. It's great table beer. It goes with any kind of food, uh, which is important to me. So Great. And Pat, Ed, Alewife, what are some of the things that, that you guys are making that you're drinking? Pills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Thousand Stars Pills is a, like really awesome, traditional, like super clean German style pills. Uh, a couple of noble hot varieties called Tettnanger and Mitten, Mitt, Mittelfuhr. Um, and I'm loving that. Uh, Kier made an Oktoberfest that I drank the hell out of. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in the Pilsner. That's what I like to drink these days. You know, I'll have one or two IPAs and then move on. Yeah, I mean, so you guys are, are, are you guys drinking like smoothie sours? Is that something you guys would actually want to drink? Or like the, you know, the really big, you know, stouts with like biscotti in them and stuff? I'll, I'll call it market research. Yes, I will. I will drink uh, <laughs> occasionally just to kind of see what other people are doing and see, see the trends and things like that. Um, you know, I enjoy them, uh, but not as much as, as something like this. So I got a question about that. You know, I know it's it's a very very niche style. You know, it's a sub style so so much. But you know, Pat and Matt, I just want to ask you guys. You know, are you guys seeing uh, in terms of uh, when people are having these styles, are uh, and specifically like the lactose, the milkshake IPAs, are they getting are they getting that second round? Are they getting that third round? Are they finding it to, to be their quote unquote session beer? You know, for the night. They're, they're selling. I know that. Um, yeah. You know, I I don't know. I guess time will tell on where it's going to go as a style you know i mean i, I think i think we saw the Br- ipa style like was in my mind like from what i'm seeing kind of a flash in the pan like everybody was doing them for one sec but they didn't really sell all that well as far as i know um you guys may have a different take on it but i'm seeing a lot of them left over in the market after new year's yeah it's really interesting i think it really all depends on the brewery their their locale uh who their customers are things like that and coney island we're very seasonal this time of year so um you know we came out with a beer a month and a half ago that was uh called mosaic underground there's no lactose in it but it was a new england ipa very juicy no bitterness to it uh and our cans sold out right away uh but it's still on tap and our regulars, the people that are coming to the brewery every day that aren't the can searchers and things like that are, you know, our best selling beer right now is called beach beer, which is a, it's a traditional Kolsch, uh, which I think is really interesting. Um, so I, it really all depends, you know, at where your brewery's at, who your, your main clientele is. So, uh, but generally I think, yes, I think, uh, a lot of people are treating those, uh, smoothie IPAs as kind of a, a session beer these days. Interesting. Wow, that's a good point. I mean, that, that's what I'm drinking, too. I mean, over the winter, some of the beers that really stood out for me were the Innerboro, the Dead Prez collaboration. That was a Vienna lager. So, mm-hmm. uh, and, and every brewery we talked to, they say they're drinking pills. I think in a couple of weeks we're doing a show about the, the, the German Black Forest pills, the Rothaus pills. Nice. Um, I don't know. Danny, you know, you've... Uh, you got perspective on everything because you make you <laughs> island to island. You also make some traditional uh, fruit fermented drinks as well. Yeah, when it comes to like the the smoothie style beers, we don't get people asking for that at all. Um, I did a DDH last year, and my customers were actually kind of grossed out by it. And I came to realize that you know can culture and and social media beer culture are different from customer culture, and that they don't translate one from the other. So, you know, the DDH was a complete bomb. So, in, so walk in me house. through. So I'm, I'm going into Island Island Brewery during beer week. And I just want to have like, I haven't had a drink all day. Take me to my first beer and then my second beer. Oh, for beer week, we're doing straight lagers. We got four lagers on. So you can start with a classic 
textbook, uh, uh, Diviner's textbook, which is a Bitter and Esther's lager. It's a Vienna lager. It's by the book. So Nothing John and crazy. Bitter and Esther's, you got a recipe John and from I them? brewed together, just nice. the two of us, no cellarmen. It was a good time together. Um, Favorite beer the, store and beer class in uh, New York City? Yes, Bitter and definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, many of us in, in, in New York came out of Bitter and Esther's in terms of learning about beer and perfecting our craft. Yeah, then you can go into something a little bit more familiar in the IPA style. We have an IPL. That's a Colorado brew lager with spruce tips. Then you go to the sweet end with the Goddess Khalifa, which is a candy corn common lager. And you finish off with Texas barbecue gold mining, which is a Dunkel black lager. So you're just going to run the spectrum of lagers. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. It's like, and, a, it's like and, a gauntlet. <laughs> Danny, can I ask which one is your favorite? See, everyone asks me that, and of the hundreds of recipes that I can make, the 10 that are on tap, those are my favorite. But of the lagers that are going to go on for New York City Beer Week, it's going to be the Goddess Khalifa, which I have actually pulled from inventory because I was drinking it. Wow. And Pat, you know, you've organized for Beer Week a really cool event next week at the gate. Tell us about that and some of the beers that are going to be there. Uh, I actually just got the list from Bobby. I was helping him set it up. Um, I mean, that's just one of a number of uh, pretty awesome events that we have. You know, we're doing a after party at Fool's Gold where I'll be spinning records after the uh, opening bash. So anybody that wants to come to that would be awesome. Um, and then uh, we're doing the Six Most Metal Breweries Night at um, St. Vitus, which we created a unique beer for, a Goza, that we just got the packaging for, and it's sick. With a band called Gozu out of Boston, <laughs> nice. But uh, and then and then Friday night is our big L Wife event with Six Point and uh, Torch and Crown, who's the brewery we make our beers out of it up in the Bronx, and they're starting to put their own stuff out. Um, Greenport Harbor and Sloop Brewing Company, so that'll be our big party at L Wife. But to answer your question, <laughs> I feel like a politician. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a pretty awesome night. We're working with Thin Man and Rare Form, and I kind of set it up as a, a, a kind of an ode to um, to craft beer bar owners, managers, and founders. And I've, I've been reaching out, spreading the tentacles, and trying to get as many people as possible over there on Thursday night for an OG kind of New York City craft beer hang thinking about all the people that we used to hang out with back in the day when I worked at the gate, you know, over 20 years ago, around 20 years ago. Um, and so far, I've gotten a huge, huge response. As you know, I reached out to you yesterday. and That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's going to be cool to see what, 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 what people drink the most that night. So Thin Man, they're, that's Mike Schatzel from Buffalo. Right. So that's a cool story. So he had, uh, was it Blue Monk? What was the name of his place? Well, the, the original Jay. bar was Cole's. That was his grandfather's bar that he, you know, was handed down through his father and then to Mike, and that's where he got a start. Then he opened the Blue Monk, and then just a slew of other places. Uh, he's got ABV. He's got a place called Coulter Bay, a place called the Moorpat, a place called Liberty Hound, and then, uh, and then uh, a place called the Terrace on, at Delaware Park. And then opened a uh, a brewery called Thin Man up in Buffalo. And what's Thin Man making? What kind of beers? Everything? All sorts of stuff. Bunch of stuff, yeah. I mean, Rudy is the head brewer there. He's coming from, I believe, Community Beer Works. Or oh, Rudy um, Watkins. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic beers coming out of Thin Man. You know, a lot of, a lot of respect for them, absolutely. And, jo and uh, James, so how do you know about them? I mean, I know they're going to be here in New York, but... Yeah, no, have you been up there? Yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, I, I actually made it up there. Uh, I met up with uh, you know the the crew from Barrier. They were doing a, a collab event there, so like I was fortunate enough to meet up with the Thin Man guys there. You know, uh, a couple of years back. So yeah, it's it, it good scene. You know, good people. So uh, you know, all the best to them. Absolutely. That's why I wanted to give a shout out to, to New York City Beer Week. You know, there's been a lot of changes. The New York City Brewers Guild. There's more, you know, there's more breweries coming in, and the, the scenes change. But this year, I'd say uh, it's really standing out, especially the last two years with Opening Bash, which is the Saturday. The number of out-of-city and out-of-state brewers that are coming in, it's pretty impressive. I mean, the fact that Thin Man's coming down uh, for, for that event alone is kind of what you expect from a beer week, isn't it? I mean, Matt, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I would think that when New York City has a beer week, everyone in the beer world should be coming here. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, um, 
you know, I've lived in New York City for a year and a half now, and uh, I've there's still breweries on my list that I haven't been to in the city. So an event where you can get everyone in the city together pouring beer is is dope to begin with, and then you bring in all these other breweries that you never get a chance to to get to as well that you know have a lot of hype behind them and stuff like that um, is really really cool. I think it's a it's a great collaborative effort, um, not only for people outside of the city but also for people. Um, you know, there's so many breweries in New York City. Uh, to have them all in one place, I think is is awesome. Yeah, and what this next beer you poured for us? What is it? Yeah, so this is uh, this is actually something that I think I'm I'm personally uh, most excited about for Beer Week is, um, you know, I come from a, a home brewing background uh, first and foremost. And last uh, last January, we gave out a bunch of work for free uh, to home brewers. They came by, we had a nice day. We we handed out work to home brewers and then challenged them to make a beer for minute. Uh, package it and then bring it back to us and we judged them. We got about 35 entries um, all from local home brewing clubs uh, and the winner chosen was this beer. It's called Midnight Troller. Uh, it, was, it was brewed by uh, a guy named Angel. Uh, it's a, a milk stout brewed with cherries uh, and a little bit of lactose. So uh, it turned out really cool. We're having a, a double can release for it on a Friday of next week. Or sorry, Friday of this week. Uh, first day of beer week. Uh, as well as our, our smash beer that we have coming out. So super excited about it. Nice. Well, how does that work? So the, the wart, did, did you get a milk stout wart? I mean, no. So what we did was, uh, you know, in, in years past, we kind of, we would do something crazy like, you know, uh, a red ale and say, hey, make a red ale. Um, I wanted to make it a little bit more uh, of an, a, a blank slate. So I just did all New York State two row, uh, made a wart just like that. So basically it's like giving an artist a piece of paper and saying, draw what you want. Uh, so we gave them two row, and you, you can add uh, steeping grains if you want to as a home brewer to it. Uh, you could add, you know, whatever you want, fruit, uh, all that kind of stuff to kind of make it your own. We had everything from stouts to porters to double IPAs to even some some Brett beers, which was pretty cool. So uh, we're doing the same thing again this year on Saturday of this week. We're giving out more wort. So it's going to become an annual thing here, but um, it was really cool. So to, do you have to sign up, or can I just go to Cone Allen Brewery and get some more? <laughs> uh, no, you did have to sign up, uh, but you know, uh, we, we circulated through the home brewing uh, newsletters and things like that throughout the uh, throughout the fall season. Can I just go with a bucket? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Hey, if we have extra, you're more than welcome. Yeah. And uh, Pat, um, what do you think of this beer, man? This is kind of cool, right? Milk stout with cherries. Yeah, it's interesting. I like that. The, it's got like kind of a little tart note on the top of it to go with the sweetness of the beer yeah man we're off to a good start and so new york city beer week starts this friday and, it's, and it runs for uh the first last week of february until like march 2nd um but we're gonna take a short break we'll be back in a minute on beer sessions radio all right and mary had two legs of chain and every chain was freedom's name This episode is brought to you by MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Featuring a variety of interactive displays, MOFAD encourages eaters of all ages to be curious about food. The museum currently operates MOFAD Lab, a 5,000-square-foot experimental space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where Chow, making the Chinese-American restaurant, is currently on show until the end of March 2019. This exhibition celebrates the birth and evolution of Chinese-American restaurants, tracing their nearly 170-year history, and sparking conversations about food culture, immigration, and what it means to be American. It highlights the evolution timeline of Chinese-American restaurant menus, dating back to 1910, and also highlights a tasting section where participants get to enjoy tastings created by the country's most talented chefs who specialize in Chinese-American cuisine. Make sure you check out Chow while you still can. The exhibition closes at the end of March 2019. Check out MoFad's tastings and extensive event calendar at mofad.org slash events. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Check us out, heritageradionetwork.org. It's our 10th anniversary. A lot's going on this year, including the Hall of Fame. A number of our Beer Sessions Radio guests will be uh, selected. It'll be, uh, every month there'll be an announcement for the 
Heritage Radio Network 10th year Hall of Fame. So looking forward to that. Um, so talking about New York City Beer Week, uh, Pat Fondelier. Uh, we're uh, going back to the event. Yeah, so <laughs> you got an event next week. This is a cool event at the Gate yep. in Brooklyn. Rare Form. Tell us about Rare Form. Rare Form is a relatively new brewery. I think they were founded in 2014 up in Troy, New York. And I, I, I became aware of them because I ran into my buddy Dave Gardell, who owns a epic, uh, like old school beer bar up in Troy, New York. And uh, these guys are buddies. So we got to talking about doing this event at the gate. I've worked at the gate for 12 years. It's another classic, like old school beer bar. Yeah. Uh, Mike Schatzel, who from up in Buffalo. I spent many years going up there for Smutty and we became super close. And then Gardell's, you know, he's from Brooklyn. He's a great dude. Uh, you know, kind of these bars are all going back to like 97, 98. Actually, Coles goes back to 1934. But we came up with the idea of like, uh, of putting together this event based around beer bars and having, um, you know, now I'm with Alewife, a new brewery came out of a bar Pat Doniger, um, you know, who I work with, just awesome dude. He, you know, he founded the Jeffrey Fool's Gold, the Rochard Alewife, and then, you know, got involved in doing the brewery with Alewife. Um, and I, you know, Chateau with all his bars and the Gardell with the Rock. And I thought it was a great combination since everybody now is in the brewing business. And, you know, reached out to Bobby. He was totally on board. But then I started reaching out and inviting people, and everybody was like, yeah, you know, Joe Carroll was like, yeah, I'll come by. And, you know, I called you, Jimmy, you, you know, you're coming through. Matt Gebhardt's coming. Like, there's just a bunch of people that own beer bars that are totally into it. Kirk Struble, Jen Torriero. Oh, you like, got Jen. Good. Yeah, yeah. The Spring Lounge. I we got to keep list of – we actually to write down uh, – Dylan, we got to write down the list of all these bars that he's mentioning because the rock up in Troy, I've I never been in. But real form, tell, tell us about their beers. Uh, you know, I haven't had too many of them. I ran into Dave on the street one day out in front of Clinton Hall, and these guys were doing an event there. This is going back a couple of weeks. And I, I had um, something on the lighter side. I think it was a pale ale. It was like low alcohol, you know, well, well executed pale ale. Um, from what I, I looked at on their list uh, yesterday, like most of their beers are like, you know, six, six percent range or lower. Um, so that's a beer you want to drink. You know, it's funny because I remember like 10 years ago, the Shelton Brother importers, they were bringing in some uh, like 4% hoppy beers from Belgium that, that everyone thought was really outrageous at the time when so many breweries were doing Imperial IPAs. I mean, there was one brewery from Vermont that came down once and uh, did a Imperial IPA, 10%. We had to have it on keg and cask at the same time. Like That's like crazy. And it's, it seems so backward, but... Um, I don't know, James. What are you, what are you saying? I, I mean, I just wanted to get back and ask Pat. Like, you know, the, the, and this kind of ties into that. It's, I mean, you go way back with a lot of these guys. You know, you talk about Doniger. You talk about Schatzel. Uh, you talk about Kurt Struble. You know, like, what do you, like, when you guys get together. <laughs> Those guys are all pups, dude. Well, yeah. to, like, the guys are all pups. <laughs> true, true. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. But there's, but they, I mean, they're still grizzled. Yeah, he calls them right. pups. Not really. Yeah. Not pups. They're, like, middle-aged. Right. You know? Right, but we're, like, we're old timers. But but I'm sure there's there's definitely like you know like an evolution as as to what they're drinking right now. And just to get back to like you know what what are people in the industry drinking? So have you noticed? Let's say when you guys get together, like was is it different ten years ago than it is what you guys are drinking now in terms of styles, in terms of you know like sensibilities? With, with I think that's just by them. virtue of the fact that like the the styles are new and they're drinking what's new. I mean these guys are all like cutting edge like beer bars like all over new york you know what i mean it's like their first run like this is the place that everybody wants to be in these right. places and they're bringing their best stuff to these guys so it's like whatever it could be anything yeah you know um it, you know interestingly i was thinking before like if you look at the actual timeline of the lager thing right when you know way back in the day in the earliest days of craft like you had to make a good lager right to get into the business to get any foothold into the industry but then they became looked down upon for the longest time and they were kind of almost verboten right like for a long period of time like you know and I, I and now that they've gained a foothold i think into that 
style, like stylistically into the business, then they're becoming more and more popular. Right. You know, I, I always felt like, you know, the, the, the American pale ale, whoever put out like a really good American pale ale, that was kind of like the signifier, like you made a really, you made really good beer. As yeah. A brewery, right. You know? And so it evolved from there. And then you, obviously the lagers that you talked about. And then, you know, now we talk about IPAs and then we talk about New England hazy IPAs. So yeah. it's just really interesting to think about it that way. I mean, to your point, like from, from my perspective, like, and I've been like this for a long time, like everybody makes IPAs they're not that difficult to make right and they also cover up a lot of flaws we all know personally if i go to a beer fest now and now more and more you see all these breweries that you never heard of you're like I, you know every every time there's like 15 more that i never even heard of it's like right. where it come from and i go up to the table i'm like give me a lager mm -hmm. give me a brown ale give me something that shows me you can make a clean beer and then i'll drink everything that you make Absolutely. but if you only have an ipa and a double ipa i'm likely not going to drink your beer right and and i guess i want to kind of direct that back to danny and matt you know as brewers you know you guys make beer what would you say is the hardest style for you guys to make right now matt um i mean i'd, I'd say the most challenging beer is anything that doesn't uh to your point pat uh anything that doesn't have a ton of flavor covering it up uh so a pilsner a kolsch a um you know anything like that um any traditional lager really um is is on that thing but not to not to stray too far away from the conversation but i grew up in kitchens before i was a brewer and i i, I always find it very funny that the things that brewers drink are not what's popular and that's always how it was in the kitchen as well like as a chef you know you're eating ratatouille and asabuco in the back like whatever's left over but those are the things that never used to sell but now <laughs> those are selling and the chefs are eating like tuna salad in the back and it'll be 10 years and tuna salad will be the popular thing it's just always funny um you know i just remember growing up at kitchens and being like how do people not like this and now loggers are starting to gain some traction i'm like now that's what I'm talking about. You know, lagers are should be more popular because they're incredibly hard to brew. Takes a, a lot of skill, and they're delicious beers. So, here, what, what here. beer are we drinking, Pat? Is that uh, this beer? is uh, this is uh, our IPA called Death to Ego, and uh, this is a new version of it that just came out. Uh, packaged on the 11th, and uh, it's a double dry hopped version of the beer. I don't think there was a lot that they changed about it. I think the ingredient. Are pretty much the same. They just changed where the additions were to make it more beefy, and <laughs> you know, I, I think it's awesome. I've, I I love this beer because it's like it's got the best of all the newfangled beers. It's got a little bit of haze to it. It's a little bit juicy up front when you try it, but then it's got this really nice, like old school, super quick well, dry finish. Nice on the back end. It's like yeah, a I was gonna say it's got a little bit of grip to it. Yeah, so yeah. So nice. And I just I love that in a beer, you know. And I miss those days, you know, the super crisp, right? super dank, you know. I was more, I was always more of a, you know, weed guy than a juice guy, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> and my beer flavor. For sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Guild meeting was at Alewife uh, last week, and I think I had probably two or three, um, maybe, uh, who knows. But that, yeah, it's a great beer. Yeah. I love it. Let's, ta let's talk about the the smash beer. So some things that the Guild of New York City Brewers Guild has done, and it's been a tradition for a while now with Beer Week, is the smash beer. I know you, I know you made that at Coney Island. Just tell us about what you made and a little bit about the history of it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I've only been in the city for a year and a half, so I don't know too much on the history, but I do know there's been some different variations uh, last year and this year. Um, both years were. Instead of doing single hop, single, hop, single malt uh, beers, they did it state malt and state hop, which allows you to use more than one malt, more than one hop if you want, as long as it was all New York ingredients, uh, which I think is really cool because it really opens up the playing field to different styles and different uh, takes on the beer. Um, this year we did a, uh, it's called Chocolate Rhizome. I have some here. We'll try it. Um, it's a... Um, a barley wine made with some chocolate rye uh, and some unmalted rye as well, uh, which really uh, creates an interesting uh, barley wine. It's 9%, uh, all New York State ingredients, and uh, it turned out really cool. I mean, we're going to have it at the opening bash, um, but we can try some here as well. Why did you make that style? Um, so, it's a long story short, uh, last year... Um, when I ordered all my malt from uh, our, our New York supplier, he sent me a free sample of chocolate rye. A whole bag of it and i'm like i don't know what i'm gonna do with this and then 
it just came to me one day. I said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to save this and we'll use it for, for beer week next year. Uh, and I just kind of built the recipe around that specific malt because uh, I had I'd worked with chocolate rye in the past, but uh, I had never focused a beer around it. Um, I've always used it as kind of a an accompanying uh, thing, but now it's kind of the star of the show in this beer, and I think it's uh, it's really cool to showcase uh, not only New York ingredients, but you know some ingredients that really don't get a lot of love. Uh, and you know, roasted rye malt is is one of those things. Can we give some shine to who the malt supplier is? Here? Yeah, of course. Yeah, New York Craft uh, is who we ordered from, and uh, we used uh, Nugget Hops from Upstate Hops as well. Nice. Both uh, excellent suppliers. Let, let, let's taste it. And then, James, I'm going to ask you a pairing question. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> it's if you look in uh, Garrett Oliver's brewmaster's table, um, what does he like to pair with barley wine? The ultimate oh, pairing. Right. So uh, as, uh, I've probably know, said this 10 times on here. Many, many people know this, you know, in, in the industry. You know, Garrett Oliver is a big fan of doing English Stilton, uh, like uh, blue cheeses with, with an English barley wine. I think they work really well in terms of their intensity. Um, I think uh, specifically with, with the English style, it's got a little bit more kind of caramel notes to it. Um, and I, I personally think, you know, when you're talking about, uh, like, you know, the Stilton, it, it, it's a little bit more sulfurous. It doesn't have, like, the fruity overtone, so it kind of works really well with, with that particular pairing. So um, I will not argue with Garrett Oliver when it comes to beer pairings, and not specifically not with this particular one. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm craving some Stilton right now. Oh, man, absolutely. And then, uh, so Matt, w- were there other, was there an English barley wine that inspired you? Um, was a recipe you took this from, or you just kind of went with it? So this is actually more of an American style. It's got a little bit more bitterness behind it, uh, a little bit more citrus notes from the the nugget hops. Um, but honestly, um, you know, I kind of, since it's a chocolate rye barley wine, it's a little bit different. Um, but, you know, I kind of built my my base uh, recipe off of what I think Sierra Nevada Bigfoot is, because uh, that's one of my favorite barley wines of all time. Uh, super easy drinking. Uh, caramel forward, uh, but still not malty, too malty and sweet. Um, so that's what I was shooting for, a little bit more uh, malt forward on the, the front end with some you know, chocolate and a little bit of bitterness from the hops on the back end uh, and a huge spicy rye character from the, the rye. Yeah, I, I think that chocolate and the rye really just kind of lends a little bit of complexity and like, you know, some texture to it, and I, I think it's a great beer. Thank you. So do, do you look forward, she must be looking forward to making this mash beer every year then. I, I mean, for me, it's uh, with the the Rupert's Cup Challenge, which is uh, a challenge sent out to all the brewers in New York City to to make a smash beer and then you know put them in competition with each other. I think it's uh, it's a really fun thing to do, uh, not only because we're competing against each other as uh, you know friends and brewers, but uh, more importantly, it's it's uh, you know supporting uh, statewide stuff, uh, which I think is super important. So yeah, I look forward to it every year. It's a it's a ton of fun and it's also challenging too because. I mean, as as we progress here, year after year, it gets easier and easier to do because New York ingredients are getting better and better. Uh, the hops are becoming more and more um, flavorful, and and the, the harvests are getting better, and the malt is getting more and more um, fruitful, uh, if that's what you, the word you want to use. Um, and it's it's awesome to to work with local partners and to uh, to go head to head with some of your neighbors. Well, cheers to that. Hey, we're gonna take one more short break. We'll be back in a minute on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Are you enjoying this podcast? Heritage Radio Network has plenty more. It's Todd Shulkin, the host of Inside Julia's Kitchen here on HRN. Inside Julia's Kitchen carries on Julia Child's legacy of introducing the brightest lights in the food world to a wider audience, just as Julia did from her home kitchen. Look for Inside Julia's Kitchen wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. All right. Hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Hey, guys, it's uh, New York City Beer Week starts on Friday, and uh, we'll get a little preview here. We've got Alewife Brewing with Pat Fonduyer and Coney Island Brewing with uh, Matt. Matt, what's your last name? McCall. McCall. <laughs> yeah. We've been on a couple times. We did a show about lactose. We started talking about what, what brewers are drinking, but we've been drinking what you guys are making. 
And I like that you uh, you made like a Belgian farmhouse style ale in your small batch facility because you're like that's what you want to drink. Yeah, uh, among other things, but yeah. And you made a barley wine, <laughs> so it's all over the place. Barley wine, which is it's it, it's getting a whole a whole menu here, James. I mean, uh, Danny from Island to Island has a whole lineup of of lagers. I I just love how people are going back to some styles that people aren't really thinking about now. You know, uh, Matt with his with his barley wine. Um, you know, Danny's doing a lot of lagers too. Um, I, I just, you know, like I'd, I'd love seeing, you know, like you know, comer- more commercial examples of anything ranging from like a, an Australian sparkling, you know, to to a, munis- uh, a Hell's Export. Like a Cooper's. You know, a Cooper's, Cooper's exactly. Sparkling. Exactly. Yeah. And so, like, you know, more power to everybody that's kind of like, you know, really. You know, it's of- funny. I read another brewer who, who doesn't usually say this. Said, I had just started drinking Hefeweizen again. Yeah. And I remember how popular that was back in the 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, have either of you made a Hefeweizen? Um, I have not since I've been at Coney, but um, oddly enough, there is uh, two of them planned for for this spring. So you'll see some coming soon. That's great, man! Here and it comes, Pat. You uh, you brought a second <laughs> beer, so you guys, ill wife, you guys went up to Equilibrium and made a beer. Well, yeah, Kira, Kira went up there, and I love how you always try and turn me into a Frenchman with the pronunciation of my last <laughs> name, which is actually of German origin. It's you're not. It's not. You're not like a French it's, Canadian. It's a hard L. It's like Fond Diller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, Kira went up and made a, a collab. And as you know, I live up in Peekskill now, so I drove up there on Saturday and hung out with the boys up there and picked up a couple of four packs to bring back. Um, Help beer, please. And I, th- I think it's fantastic. Just double IPA, super hazy. So this collab, you guys, Kira made it, it there, but it's being sold th- through Equilibrium? Yeah, they... Yeah, when when you do a collab with a brewery like that, like they have the rights to the beer, so they sell it. So then, and they'll you know then they'll come here and they'll make one with us, and vice versa. We did one with Thin Man that's going to be available for Beer Week, um, and then you know I mean that's just the the that's the way it is. Yeah, no, and that's I mean we earlier Matt we were talking about that. I know a lot of the. Especially around here, some of the brewers like Interboro, KCBC do a lot, do a lot of collabs. They actually go like around the world. Like Pete from KCBC's made beer in, in Norway. Um, but your approach is a little different, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody's approach is different. I'd love to have friends all over the world, but I'm not that popular, unfortunately. Um, but you know, where we are popular is um, you know in our local community, and I think um, um, you know working with with partners that are are near and dear to our hearts, I think is first and foremost for us. So we did a collaboration with the New York City Craft Beer, uh, Gay Craft Beer Lovers Club. Uh, we did a pride beer with them last year, which was super cool, uh, not only for the for the beer, but mo- more for the, you know, kind of the whole event. What was the beer? It was a, uh, it was just an IPA. It was called Pride 365. Uh, we used Super Pride hops in it, which is a derivative of Pride of Ringwood. Um, and uh, the coolest part was we had this whole club. There's about 40 folks that came down uh for a collab day and like each one of them got to stir the mash and be a part of it and add hops to the kettle and you know just uh, creating kind of an intrinsic uh you know brew day and it it resonated throughout um you know our community as well as theirs and uh, it was a really cool event and uh, those are the things that we kind of focus on is you know um not that there's anything wrong with traveling the world. I'd love to. If there's any breweries in Iceland listening, I'd love to visit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, first and foremost, you know, we're focused on, on, on focus, focusing our attention on, uh, you know, events and, and partnerships that mean a lot to us. But beer, brewery kicks off your season, right? So you guys, you have the brewery at, at Coney Island at, at the baseball stadium. That's right. Yeah. MCU Park. And then for in the summertime, you must be really packed. Yeah, for, uh, I mean our busy season's made a made a August really. Um, I mean not not that we're not busy throughout those months, but comparatively speaking, yeah, uh, it's it's kind of mayhem. No, I'm there. glad that you guys both came on because it's, it's a nice little snapshot. And when Danny too from Island to Island, but it's a nice snapshot of just how healthy the New York City uh, brewing scene is. Where you know. At one time, we could jam eight people in here, and that was the entire <laughs> group of brewers in New York City. But um, I want to hear more about Alewife. So you guys, you got the little brew pub in Long Island City. Yeah, we call it Alewife, the brew pub. Uh, it's an existing bar that was there for like four or five years. But I think when Pat Pat picked it up, I don't want to speak for him, but I think his vision was all along opening a brewery. At least that's what I've been told. So that was the plan when he snagged the space. I know he originally looked at putting the brewery in that building, but then structural tests showed that it wouldn't 
support it. So he looked for another place and picked, you know, we now have a space out on uh, 39th and Skillman. So in Queens. It's in Sunnyside. It's right on the border of Long Island City in Astoria. It's a really great location. That's where the production facility is going to be. And right now we're brewing in a uh, on a one-barrel system in the brew pub. And, you know, Cure Hamilton, who's our head brewer, ex-mad uh, scientist from Six Point and distiller at Widow Jane. He's really awesome Scottish oh, I dude. I didn't know he had the distiller background. Too. Yeah, yeah, he's a beast. And he, um, you know, he's brewing one barrel batches over there and they're coming up on the thing matt in the hierarchy of uh you know skilled jobs what what takes a your higher iq do you get to be a distiller or a brewer oh uh probably a distiller yeah uh just because i mean not only are you you have to brew something before you distill it so they're already doing the job that we do it doesn't have to be quite as clean as the way we do it but there's a lot more i mean when i look at distilling i don't know I know that it can kill people, and I, I'm out on that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they're both good teams. Brewers and then and for you, yeah. for Kier, I mean, so I, he's kind of a scorer then. I mean, I remember he was at the Six Point, the Red Hook location. Um, how did he team up with Alewife? Well, he, he, you know, Pat and him had been talking for years, and Pat's, you know, I, I've been told that Pat really wanted to, um, uh, you know, hook up with him and open a brewery because he's very talented, you know. I mean, he's making great beers, and I'm 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 super stoked to be hooked up with these guys. You know, just accidentally, I walked in there one day. He said he was looking for a sales guy, and it was like, boom, that was it. That was my interview. And you you've got a lot. <laughs> you worked at the gate, so you know you know the retail side, the bar side. You were the smell you nose rep here for a long time. For eight years. Yeah, and then you also did uh, what was it, uh, Schmaltz? Yeah, I was. With um, Jeremy Cowan for a minute, yeah. um, before, you know, right before he sold the brewery to Single Cut. Um, you know, Jeremy is my old friend. Going back, you know, the, the connection to when he founded Coney Island and you guys used to do for Beer Week. Used to do a Freaktoberfest or something too, right? Yeah, yeah. some we cool had a beer events, festival. But five years it was crazy. I'm glad you're on because I, 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 <laughs> to me, you're one of the faces in New York City beer. Pat. I like your email. It's, I'm going to tell everyone it's yeti at alewife yeah. brewing or something. But right. <laughs> I love that too. But um, I think it's just by virtue of the fact that I'm still drinking and I'm old as shit. <laughs> and you got a beard. <laughs> He's got a beard, guy. So, but um, there was a fun talk about beer. There was a funny video with Conan O'Brien. He was. If you guys see it, he was at uh, Sam Adams Brewery with Jim Cook. And he was he was ragging on all the guys that every guy in the brewery had a beard and he, it was a pretty funny video and Jim Cook was playing along with it but what's it like being part of that group so it is interesting you know Coney Island we kind of know the brand from New York but I know it's part of the Sam Adams portfolio just tell us a little bit about that Matt what you can say about it yeah sure I mean um, it's it's funny because Sam Adams couldn't be more uh, far disconnected from Coney Island um, than, you know, I am to Alewife. Um, it, you know, we know each other, uh, but by all means, uh, they don't have any kind of insight into what we do. Uh, you know, there there are kind of our, uh, we're part of Boston Beer Company, number one, which owns Sam Adams and owns Coney Island. Um, but outside of that, um, they provide us some funding for, for uh, resources for uh, HR, you know, payroll, that type of thing. Uh, but outside of that, you know, I'm the one making the decisions uh, on what beers we're brewing. Um, and the innovation is really uh, driven from Coney Island. So they give us the ability uh, to do what we're doing. Uh, and they give us the, the awesome production facilities to brew our flagship beers. Uh, but outside of that, our, our relationship to, to Sam Adams is pretty much non-existent. Yeah. And what are the flagships that you're brewing uh, at your production facility? Um, Merman Mermaid. What's the Merman? Merman's our IPA. Oh yeah, it's our flagship IPA. I, I've, I've had. I was saying before, I really like the the Mermaid Pilsner. It's a great beer for events. Yeah, it's fantastic, and I think one of the the greatest parts about talking about what I want to drink. Man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the the greatest parts about being part of Boston Beer, and and you had mentioned Jim Cook is his uh, his level of excellence that he requires for his his beer, uh, and with that comes you know when we have our our beer produced at a production facility, when we want it to be top notch and. Uh, I, I worked at the production facility for three and a half years, uh, and I can tell you that uh, without a doubt, the, the production standards and quality standards are, are bar none. So 
it's probably one of the reasons you love the Pilsner so much is because there's a lot of... Because uh, you made it. Really? No, well, before, before, yeah, years ago. But, when I uh, drank it, you made yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. But there's a lot of attention paid to detail. Um, and if the product's not good, they don't send it out. And that's important. James, James Ty, what, what, what's my... Uh, What's my drinking list this week from James Ty? Your drinking list, <clears throat> again, getting back to like you know some of the, the, the forgotten styles, I would suggest, Jimmy, you go ahead and uh, find yourself an old ale, a British old ale. You know, I would say you'd find yourself a Trappist single, and I would say perhaps maybe like a pre- pre-prohibition pil- uh, porter. I think that's your list. That's a good that. one, Jim. Did you yeah. did you come in with that already in your mind? No, no, no. I just I, I just felt the vibe, Jimmy. The old. What about you, Pat? What should I drink this week? <laughs> Serious? Yeah, man. <laughs> Session IPA, IPA, double IPA, and triple IPA. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like everybody else is. And then I'm gonna go to Danny. Danny, uh, did I miss the the jerk wing lager fest at Island to Island? Not at all. That's March second. That's on my list. Yeah. So I'm going to come try all four lagers. Yes, all four and lagers. And you're going to have a tray of jerk wings that are seasoned in our own beer. And how much does that cost me? 35 And you get a mug. But I get all that stuff. Yeah, you get all that stuff, and you're drinking from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. And I get to check out Flappish Brooklyn. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm overdue. You get to check Let's out Let's talk Flatbush. about that. The only thing about breweries, I feel like the breweries, it used to be that like it was like gay clubs and, and, and just kind of music venues were, were opening in all these different neighborhoods. But now it seems like the, the breweries are, are doing that. I mean, Coney Island, there's a brewery there. You guys are going to check out Sunnyside, Island to Island, Flatbush. I, I haven't really been to most of these neighborhoods. Yeah. March uh, 2nd is Ruby's birthday, too. Your daughter, yeah. Mm. Cool. <laughs> Does anyone want to comment about that, about uh, yeah. the role of breweries kind of in, in the local community? So I think, you know, from a very basic standpoint, breweries, um, you know, for the last five to ten years probably even before that um you know have really focused on getting into areas that were underdeveloped uh kind of forgotten about uh there's a lot of breweries from my hometown of pennsylvania that are popping up in an old industrial district uh where there's not a lot of um you know growth for retail space and what what you're seeing happening is breweries pop up they're drawing people in and then other retail spaces are following so that that kind of um you know influx of of traffic and revenue is being driven by breweries and i think brooklyn is a great example of that because i mean brooklyn's a huge place uh, i mean geographically a small place but in in terms of people it's huge um but you have all these areas that you know sunset park where five boroughs is and coney island where we are um all over the place there's there's these places popping up where there's not a ton of stuff going on, uh, so to speak, uh, and then breweries pop up and all of a sudden other things are following, and it's not not necessarily gentrification by any means because a lot of people coming to the brewery are locals that live around these places, um, but they are starting a wave of of influx of places that may or may not have been forgotten about. Yeah, and Danny, uh, you were on the show a couple of shows this month. We talked about you know role of breweries and local businesses. Um, what do you want to say about the role of your place and your community and uh, anything about it? I totally agree with Matt. Like, people don't realize that breweries are manufacturing facilities. Like, we're not retailers at the core of our business. We create brands and then we create jobs from that, jobs that people can literally retire on because it is a high skill industry. It's not just something where you come in and say, hey, I'm going to be at front of house for, you know, a pair of sneakers or a vacation. Something where there's a lot of training involved, there's a lot of skill involved, and then there has to be a love for the industry as well. And I think any brewer or brewery owner can attest to the fact that if you get employees who don't love the job, they're gone in a matter of months. And I think that it's important that breweries open up in economically deprived neighborhoods because it helps to infuse not only a love for the neighborhood, but bring people in. Specifically with my brewery, I like to focus on tourism you know i would say you can start at the museum you can go to the the park you can go to the gardens the theater and then end the night with a drink with us and that's all within walking distance and i think that breweries open up in deprived neighborhoods underserved neighborhoods helps to infuse it in that way and then on march 2nd yes march 2nd we have the jerk and lager festival for craft and i'm going to that week in new york and it is trinidadian jerk wings not jamaican trinidadian i I love wings and beer there was a a story about new york city restaurants 
a East Village Wings restaurant, I will not name it, had pre pre sold a whole bunch of wings for the Super Bowl, and something happened. And there's photos of of uh, the delivery guys waiting outside. Uh, and a lot of people didn't get their orders. And the real reason I'm telling you that is I never thought about how popular wings are. I love wings. And uh, I don't know. More breweries should, should do wings, right? Good job, Danny. <laughs> That's my rant. That was crazy. I might get kicked off the air for that one. Wings. Who would have thought with beer? What we about got, you, Pat? What are we having at your festival next week? We got wings at L Wife. You got wings? March 2nd is also Dr. Seuss's birthday. Oh. Yeah. Um, what was the question? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> now we're doing on March 2nd, our event is at St. Vitus, and it's called the Six Most Metal Breweries, which is Adam Zuniga, uh, ex uh, Six Point employee, and then he was with Lord Hobo for a minute, and he started this organization, and they're doing these like small beer festivals at the Metal Club here in Brooklyn, and I... Uh, uh, you know, we made a beer for for the party. It's a Goza. We made it with a band called Gozu out of Boston, and uh, the artwork is crazy. Um, you know, they're they're on a label called Black White Media, which is owned by Chris Santos from the TV show Chopped. Oh right, and it's affiliated with Metal Blade and. It's pretty awesome. You have a music background too, don't you? I do. I was in the business for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, what, and tell what, what why it goes up. Uh, that crowd. was a request of the band. Joe Grotto, Joseph Grotto is the bass player in the band Gozu, and he was my uh, he was my uh, uh, co worker at Smutty Nose for a million years. He was our he was our numbers guy, um, and him and I worked very closely together. Um, and I, uh, you know, they come down here quite often to play, and I'm a huge fan of the band and of him. And when we asked him about doing the, the collab, he said, yeah. And then I, I asked him what he wanted to do, and he said it goes us. So, you know, when we, we asked him to describe what he likes, we were, like, totally on the same page because I don't like them when they're super tart. I like them more in the salty realm and to be softer and not so harsh. You don't want lime. Yeah, you know. So that's what we made. And that sounds I, great, man. Yeah, we'll have it at the party. You always do a great job. I, I actually learned more about New York City Beer Week from the Alewife Brewing email <laughs> I got, and I really found it informative. So I'll be there February 20th. I'll be at uh, oh, it's the be gate that event. night with yeah. all these great old craft beer beer, beer guys, and uh, I can't wait to try Thin Man, Rare Form. And James, anybody that's uh, any brewers coming to town that you really want to try or that you we should we should know about? That I you well, know? Um, I, I know they're about to kind of do like a – Kind of like a cult-ish splash, but Toppling Goliath, you know, very, very highly rated. They're about to make their New York City kind of uh, entree, and that that should be really exciting. Where are they from? Gosh, where are they from? It's too much. They're from the Midwest somewhere. Yeah. I, I want to say, say like Iowa. Wisconsin, maybe? Oh, yeah. I saw a hashtag. It said hashtag Midwest. So. Yeah. yeah. Flyers. Uh, yeah. And Matt, what about you? Any, anybody brewers that you're into? Um, you know, particularly speaking, uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head that are, are sticking out, but I would say... Um, you know, more so, I'm I'm focused on the New York breweries. I, I'm always curious to see what their smash beers taste like. So, and when which smash beers do you want to try? Uh, I'm always, uh, I'd I'd be remiss to to not mention Jason from Strong Rope. He's uh, he's the master with New York ingredients. Uh, he's got the deepest ties to the New York uh, dis- uh, suppliers and things like that. And he just makes excellent beer. So Dude, I look that's a great. That. Show. I'm gonna give a big shout out to Jason Saylor at Strong Rope, who's really been the leader in New York City for. Uh, New York State Farm Breweries and uh, sourcing ingredients. And Danny, uh, any other shout outs you want to give? Yeah, shout out to Black Beer Travelers who are coming to hang out with us for our event. Uh, Harlem, uh, Wartega, they'll be in the building as well. And I would like to really thank uh, Southern Beer Girl from Colorado and uh, Derek from Dirty Jobs Brewing in Texas who did the collaborations with me. I'm so glad that they were willing to reach across state lines and Make it happen for All New right, York. All right, guys. Let's go around one more time. Everybody uh, say their name and where they're from. Uh, Pat it Von Diller, head of sales for Alewife. And Toppling Goliath is in Iowa. That was a pretty damn good guess. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> Danny Oliver, Island Talent Brewery. James Ty, Beer Acolyte Consulting. At Beer Acolyte. There we are. And Matt McCall, head brewer, Coney Island. 
Well, thanks for thanks for joining us here. A uh, big shout out to our producer Justin Kennedy, engineer Matt Patterson, and Dylan Hoyer, our, our intern, assistant producer, buddy. She's getting promoted. She's done a great job for us. And I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. Thanks for joining us on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo! Hey. Woo! Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, to learn more about our 10-year anniversary celebration happening all year long, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com forward slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the AHRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.